foundation, and we host all of our programs before COVID right here in this auditorium. So if you don't know about us, I encourage you to visit our website, thebatonfoundation.org, so that you can see the programs we have coming up beginning in February. One thing that we started this year at the Baton Foundation was an essay contest to help young people, boys and girls, better understand the role that the unsung heroes, so-called unsung heroes, of the civil rights movement played in helping to affect change in this country. I'm from New York, and all of my life I grew up knowing about Dr. King and Rosa Parks, and of course Malcolm X, who was killed in New York City. But until I moved to Atlanta 22 years ago, I'd never heard the name Hosea Williams. I had no idea who he was. And like Hosea Williams, who was actually um, not so unsung, there are thousands of others about whom we know very little or absolutely nothing. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here this evening <clears throat> to be amongst Reverend Williams' family and friends, Dr. Rice and his family, and our colleagues here at the Auburn Avenue Research Library to help celebrate Reverend Williams' birthday, his 96th birthday, I believe it would have been, uh, Miss Omalami. And uh, it's just a real pleasure for us to be here this evening. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dr. Rice's daughters, Madison Rice and Mandy Rice. And where are you young ladies? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am Madison Rice, Dr. Rice's oldest daughter. I'm Marley Rice, Dr. Rice's middle daughter. We will, we will serve, serve as your MCs for this, for this book talk. <laughs> We will now invite Dr. Barbara Williams Emerson and Ms. Elizabeth Omalami, two of Hosea Williams' daughters, will bring the occasion. There's no way that I'm going to be as eloquent as those young ladies were. <laughs> this is my sister Barbara's deal. And she is, I'm sure, trying her best to get here because she gave her whole life, several years, I guess, Rolandus, to this. How many years? since 2014, and she is the reason uh, in our family that this book happened. And I'm very emotional tonight, so just excuse me, but we must tell our stories. To have Rolanda's Rice have an understanding about who Hosea Williams was, was a miracle from God. Because we knew it had to be done, we just didn't know where to go to get it done. And when he bit, he bit the whole apple. 
he didn't just take a bite and say, yeah, well, he's an interesting man. Both his parents were blind. Then he ran away because he got in a fight with a white man. And then he was raised by a whorehouse. And the ladies took real good care of him, taught him how to run numbers. And he went to the war, became a chemist, and worked for Dr. King. I mean, he took this thing apart in a way that, and that is the truth, all of that that I said. But why is it that we don't know who our heroes are? Why are our children looking to Pokemon and Minecraft to find their heroes? What damage are we doing to their young minds that they have to look to soul to and sing to and what is this Hispanic thing that's out now? Cantana? Huh? In Cantu. Can, in Cantu. And this is where they're finding their heroes. So how are they supposed to know who they are? My sister has been involved in changing and raising young minds all of her life. I mean, she worked at Queens College helping young black students get into college. That was her whole life then. She saw so much suffering in our community. She, she saw so much pain. And she and I are like two sides of two different coins. <laughs> we is very different. But Hosea Williams raised all of us. My sister Yolanda, my brother Jose, that's Portia's daddy and Lauren's daddy. He passed in 98. My brother Andre, who's moving back to Atlanta. And I was just talking with someone today about the pain that comes from being a daughter of the civil rights movement. When you look at the requirements of a healthy daddy-daughter relationship, and you know you never had that, because he wasn't there. But he was where he thought he should be to make the, here she comes, I shall stop talking. <laughs> Give her a hand, everybody. <laughs> I was holding it warm for you, sis. I was getting ready to get real emotional. So I'm glad you showed up. But this is the woman that made this happen. I'm, I'm going to, come on now. That's right, right on time. I am my father's daughter. He would love to make um, a late but right on time entrance. Thank you all for coming. This is indeed a wonderful and important evening. It is a moment that I have been waiting for for at least the last 20 years. This is a celebration of the 96th birthday of Hosea Williams, and it is the celebration of the launch of Hosea Williams, a lifetime of defiance and protest by Dr. Rolandas R. Rice. <laughs> Rolandas has accomplished something that both Hosea Williams wanted to do and that Barbara Williams Emerson wanted to do. And that was to publish, to not only, well, before even publishing, to gather together the material and the documentation that would present the complex life of Hosea Williams. It is a story that I always say proves the point 
that your circumstances do not determine your destiny. And I think that is the most underlying significant point about Hosea Williams' life. You take a child who was born to a blind, black, young woman just prior to the Depression in the rural southwest corner of Georgia, who becomes the only civil rights leader who was at the ground level of the two movements that produced the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, the most two significant outcomes of the Civil Rights Movement, and founded it the Hosea Feed the Hungry, the largest, one of the largest direct to foods to direct to client food service agencies in the Southeast that has continued 50 years later and 20 years after his death. That is a significant <laughs> achievement and that has been taken to a whole new level by his family. That has not happened anywhere else by any other person. And to be able to tell that story, and Rolandus has done it in a way that is a storyteller's dream beyond that of a scholar. So tonight, all of that comes together, and it just fills me with joy to see it happen. So I thank you, Rolandus. I thank you all for coming out to celebrate these two achievements. And it is gratifying to me for this to happen because it is the culmination of a heartbreaking, a heartbreaking series of events which we have witnessed in which Hosea Williams has been excluded from the history of the civil rights movement and he has been set aside in a way that has been glaring to us and has been mysterious to us. And I'll give you a couple of examples. And it's not a I used to wonder at some points, is, is this a conspiracy theory or is this my imagination? But there were such glaring examples. For instance, at one point there was a photography exhibit at the High Museum. And there was a picture in that exhibit of the front line of a march. And the original photograph was in the museum in the exhibit. And they blew that photograph up to the size of the multi-story portion of the High Museum. But somehow in blowing it up to the multi-story size of the museum, they managed to crop Jose Williams off of the picture that was on the outside of the museum. When we went to the 50th anniversary of the Selma to, of the, the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, which was organized, that march was organized by Hosea Williams and led by him and John Lewis, who arrived that morning of the march, John Lewis did, but Hosea Williams had organized it and walked shoulder to shoulder with John Lewis across the bridge when the Williams family got there that morning of the march, I had to act like Hosea Williams in order to get us seats that were near the front of where people were sitting. The only reason that Elizabeth got on the stage was that she happened to go to the bathroom and somebody told her, asked her if she was on the stage on the program and she said no. And they said, well, go up there and sit on the stage and ain't nobody gonna tell you to move. And that's how she got on the program. But I had to almost act the fool in front of some cameras in order to get us some seats. 
And we never got to meet the president who was there for the event. When I went to the, my sister Yolanda and I went because someone else gave us some tickets to go to the Smithsonian, when we went, we couldn't find, there's a brochure that's in Rolandus's book that happens to be in a case and there's another brochure laying there covering up the picture of Hosea Williams. When we found the picture of Hosea Williams, when we found Hosea Williams' name, there was a picture of someone else in place of where he was. I'm not going to give you any more examples because you see when I start talking about that stuff, it upsets me. So the fact that Rolandus has written this book and has done it in such a way that he documents Hosea Williams' role, and in addition to that, because of the presence of the papers here, at his papers here at the Auburn Avenue Library, and I would like to personally thank, I think she's here, Francine Henderson, a former director of this library, for placing those papers here and having, giving Rolandus and other scholars access to those papers. He was able to incorporate Jose's voice through an unpublished autobiography manuscript into the book. So the book is very unusual in the sense that it not only is a scholarly vetted, twice scholarly vetted, because Rolandus was the second person, black person in the history of Auburn University to get a PhD in history. So it's gone through all of the vetting at Auburn University. And then it was published by the University of South Carolina Press. So it went through all the vetting that it takes to get published by a, a academic press. So it has been well vetted by the academic community as a scholarly piece of work. And it then also includes the voice of the person that he is doing it on. It is a unique piece of work and he writes it like a detective. So read the book. It is a great piece of work. And in um, recognition of his wonderful work in producing this scholarly, readable, I'm an academic, and not all dissertations which are turned into books are readable, um, but in recognition for what he has done for Hosea Williams by beginning this, which I think will lead to many other things, perhaps a Presidential Medal of Honor, perhaps a movie, or some type of visual for this generation which learns visually. But because he has furthered the civil rights movement in the way that it has, he has, I would like to, on behalf of the veterans of the civil rights movement, of which there are a few of us left, present him with a honor as a new civil rights worker with a medallion. And for those of us who know what the medallion is, it represents what Jose Williams thought was Stand out so we can see this, absolutely. Was someone who had made a significant contribution to the wow. rights wow. of our people. So you'll see a few people here wearing those tonight, and they are either civil rights veterans 
are the children of civil rights veterans. You do not come by those easily. I'll just tell you quickly where they came from. Um, in, in the early 1970s, um, Hosea Williams went on a brotherhood trip, a brotherhood tour to where he visited 16 African countries uh, and met with people including Haley Selassie and as heads of states in order to try to develop relationships between African Americans and African nations. It really was the beginning of, of Pan-Africanism and he took those medals which were uh, made here in Georgia and the casts were broken after that and a reel-to-reel -reel tape about Dr. King and he visited those nations and trying to build uh, relationships between those nations as well as the United States and a few were left and those were given to people that he thought in the civil rights movement had made significant contributions. So I think by writing this book Rolandas has indeed made a significant contribution by bringing to us one of the most significant but most overlooked members of the civil rights movement. Thank you very much for being here and buy and read the book. Those were great remarks. Thank you. <laughs> now we will hear from Dr. Dorothy Archery, my dad's professor from Alabama State University. Dr. David Carter, my dad's professor from Alabama. Auburn State University. Oh my goodness. Auburn University. Auburn University will follow Dr. Archie. Dr. Archie, will you come forward? I'm going to speak tonight on the importance of historically black colleges and universities in producing students like our noted scholar, Dr. Alundis Rice. Historically black colleges and universities, known as HBCUs, constitute one of the nation's most important resources. From their origin during the decade preceding the Civil War, to the period when the majority of these institutions came into being at the end of slavery in 1865, to the HBCUs emerging during the early to mid-decades of the 20th century. These schools have produced individuals who have made their mark on society in virtually every profession. Most importantly, these institutions have helped redefine American democracy. HBCUs were founded during an era when segregationist laws and practices banned African Americans from schools across the nation. But the founders of what once was as many as 105 black colleges and universities realized that higher education elevated blacks' prospects for full inclusion in society. The author of the study of the early years of Alabama State University, Joseph Caver, stated that former slaves who established the first schools in Alabama equated freedom with opportunities for education. Jelani Favors, 
in a study of racial activism at black higher education institutions described HBCUs as a place of refuge from the terrorism of the Jim Crow era. According to favors, HBCUs were the vital seat beds for politicians, community leaders, reformers, and activists who challenged the nation to live up to the lofty principles Americans claimed to revere in the nation's democratically based documents. Beyond the racial activism of these institutions during the civil rights and black power movements, HBCU served as a sanctuary for African Americans looking for a new beginning, says Favor. The students entering HBCUs in the post-slavery era received only a primary and secondary education within a teaching a normal school curriculum. Over time, these schools developed into junior high schools and high school departments. Collegiate programs came into being for these schools after many years of struggle against discriminatory funding and other kinds of second-class treatment, in addition to the school's realization for a more intensified educational program for producing individuals capable of competing in a racially hostile environment. The students who attended these schools could expect a top-level education from black professors committed to their full intellectual development. But what made these schools unique included the mentoring students received from professors who were invested in their well-being the feeling of self-worth, self-confidence, and identity the schools fostered, connections students developed with others who had emerged from the same background of racial oppression, and a sense of meaning HBCU students derived from a past which taught them perseverance against often overwhelming odds. HBCUs offered students a grounding in idealism and a mission to uplift for the community. These schools introduced students to uh, African-American literature, art, and music. HBCUs provided these pupils with opportunities to expand their social interaction with their peers through campus organizations and athletic activities. In essence, apart from the black family and the black church, HBCUs have been critical to the survival of the African American community while serving as a voice of conscience to a nation in desperate need of continual reminders regarding the ideals upon which the nation had been established. Alabama State University is one of the approximately 88 black schools and colleges existing today, which have advanced black progress toward the American dream. Since its founding by nine former slaves in 1867, two years following the Civil War, ASU functioned as a center for educational development and cultural and social enrichment for thousands of students, most of whom were from farms and small towns of Alabama and elsewhere in the South. The school gained its initial renown as a teacher education institution with a liberal arts focus. But between the 1930s and the 2000s, ASU graduated the largest number of public school teachers in the nation. During the 1950s to the 1970s, ASU students, faculty, staff, alumni, and alumni stood on the front lines of the civil rights movement, participating in the Montgomery bus boycott, the sit-in movement, the Freedom Rise, and the Birmingham demonstrations, and the 1965 voting rights crusade. In 2006, Rolandis Rice entered ASU as a graduate student in the Department of History and Political Science Master's History program. Over the next four years, he would benefit from attending an institution with a rich history of the complete dedication to the full maturation of those within his care. The department admitted the student without an undergraduate history degree based on the belief that he possessed the academic abilities which would enable him to fulfill the requirements of completing the program. Mr. Rice struggled for a while. <laughs> but he received the support from the Department of Faculty, 
the mentoring is central to his progress as a graduate school student and writing assistance which helped polish the skills of this budding scholar. Meanwhile, Mr. Rice was provided opportunities to take part in Black History Month programs and civil rights programs. Participation in these activities bolstered his self-esteem and introduced him to nationally known historians, political leaders, and civil rights leaders, and introduced him to all that he needed to know for this program. In essence, a team of faculty members within ASU Department of History and Political Science, including Dr. Burtis English and Dr. Howard Robinson and I, were determined in our capacity to put forth every effort to ensure the success of what was admittedly a student who through hard work and determination could become one of the best students the department had ever produced. During his ASU experience, Rolandus Rice also benefited from his association with ASU's National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture under the Dean of ASU's Library and the National Center Project Chair, Dr. Janice Franklin, and Dr. Howard Robinson, who is currently Assistant Dean of ASU's Library. I was pleased to mentor Mr. Rice during his work as staff associate of the National Center as the center's program chair. As a National Center staff associate, Mr. Rice helped execute civil rights programs, hosted civil rights leaders and guests, and appeared on civil rights programs. Again, these experiences provided him the knowledge and connections which have resulted in his emergence as a civil rights scholar today. Mr. Rice's success in the publication of his noted work on Hosea Williams was not completely, however, the result of his knowledge and skills he gained at ASU. In 2006, Mr. Rice entered ASU with an intense desire to mature as a student in African American history. He entered ASU's Master of History program with a commitment to the deeper meaning of the African American past. Mr. Rice became a student at ASU with intellectual capabilities which only needed to be improved upon by concerned mentors. He became a graduate student at ASU and staff associate of the ASU's National Center for Civil Rights with a measure of creativity and oratorical abilities which has given him unique qualities as a researcher and as a speaker. Most importantly, Mr. Rice entered ASU with a set of values, family values, which have sustained him through several crises in his life. Each of these factors has been important in bringing Rolandus Rice the event we celebrate tonight. Alabama State University congratulates Rolandus Rice on this amazing milestone in his professional, intellectual, and academic career. We will always, we will always regard him still as our student and as a beloved colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Autry. Um, it's tough to know where to begin, and it's tough to keep my remarks brief when talking about um, such an extraordinary scholar and, and someone I'm honored to call a, a dear friend, uh, but I will try to do that. Uh, I met Dr. Rice um, when he was introduced to me uh, directly by Dr. Burtis English, but quickly upon arriving in Alabama, I came to know uh, Dr. Autry and, and Dr. Janice Franklin and Dr. Howard Robinson, and I just want to echo those words of importance about uh, the, the centrality of the HBCUs um, to uh, not just a sort of cradle of freedom approach to understanding the movement, uh, but also to understanding the movement from a scholarly viewpoint. Uh, and to stress that for many activists in the movement, they had to make agonizing existential choices between pursuing their own education uh, or pursuing this vocation of the freedom struggle. And Hosea Williams is a perfect example of that. Uh, somebody uh, incredibly talented chemist uh, and that Morris Brown HBCU experience who then has to, to make that choice. Uh, do I follow my professional career? And nobody would have second guessed him had he chosen to do that or do I put the greater needs of this black freedom struggle uh, above my own personal needs? And so I'm always astonished at the, um, 
uh, the, 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 those decisions that people, people made. Um, this is a story that Dr. Rice has written that in many ways is a story of batons. And so our opening speaker, I thought the Baton Foundation is a perfect metaphor for passing along uh, these, not only uh, uh, these responsibilities, but inspiring the next generation. It's a story of baton passing, torch bearing, uh, and, and as everyone has said, Dr. Rice tells this story so well. When he told me he wanted to write a biography of Hosea Williams, I said, that is one of the best proposals for a dissertation I've ever heard. And then I said, this is going to be hard. You're going to have to fight to tell this story. Uh, because uh, one of the problems of the academy, I would say, is that we have fallen out of love with biography. And we have fallen out of love with the power of storytelling. And so to hear you all talk about where do our young people find their heroes, we're not telling the stories of the heroes. And we're writing, I think, some first-class history and noting the importance of communities, of institutions like HBCUs, the centrality of African-American churches and other religious communities. But sometimes we're failing to tell the stories. And even when we do tell the stories, as was noted, we are erasing people and we are silencing people and we are marginalizing people. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta. And Jose Williams, thanks to journalists, uh, was in the newspaper uh, and actually was rendered in important ways. Uh, and I was lucky enough to have parents who recognized uh, the importance of, of Jose Williams and would tell me when sometimes the headlines weren't always flattering, you need to know who this person was and what he not only did, but what he continues to do. And I think it's a story that Dr. Rice uh, introduces to us in powerful ways. Uh, Rolandes asked me to talk a little bit about the historiography of the movement, that is, what has been written about Hosea Williams. And I can do that in two words, three words, not nearly enough. He has been too often relegated to a footnote, and this is one of the greatest insults in terms of overlooking somebody who was a critical foot soldier over and over, and not just on the bridge in March of 1965, but before he encountered Dr. King. Uh, taking his story back to Savannah, uh, Rolandes does this extraordinary job of showing us the life trajectory of an activist and broadening the story of the movement from familiar places like Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham, as important as those were, to unfamiliar geographies like Savannah, like St. Augustine, like Chicago, uh, so many places where, as you all have noted before me so eloquently, tens of thousands of unsung heroines and heroes made history and have since been cropped out of the pages of history, out of the photos in our mind's eye of history. So what Dr. Rice has done with this book is such an important restoration. I remember when Taylor Branch brought the life of Vernon Johns, one of Dr. King's predecessors at uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church to life. And this story is that kind of act of historical recovery. It is reintroducing us to somebody that we should have known all along. So I am so grateful as a scholar that Dr. Rice is telling this story, and as you all have noted, telling it in a very readable and compelling way. So I commend him for that. Uh, I want to close by just saying a couple of things about uh, echoing Dr. Autry's words about the importance of the HBCU and to note that the HBCU, uh, Dr. Burtis English, there's a line. He was our first African-American student in history at Auburn to receive the PhD degree in history. Dr. Rice became the second uh, African-American student to receive the PhD in history at Auburn. I just had the honor to work with Dr. Sherry Williams, who became the first black woman to receive the history PhD at Auburn, and it will give me such great joy to present to Dr. Williams Dr. Rice's signed book uh, as Dr. Williams works on her own book. So there's a story there of batons being passed and torches, and I just want to thank Dr. Autry and Dr. Franklin and Dr. Robinson uh, and Dr. English, because whatever you all did, I was able to work with an extraordinarily gifted student. Uh, as soon as Rolandus came into my office, I had the sense that this was going to be 
uh, an intellectual relationship that was going to be uh, something that gave to me probably a lot more than I was ever able to impart to him. And he has certainly rewarded that. And the last HBCU connection I want to honor tonight is to make sure that nobody leaves this auditorium tonight. We all know and will know more about Hosea Williams, but I also want to give a shout out to someone who passed away in recent months, and that's Dr. Harold Franklin. Dr. Harold Franklin was a graduate of Alabama State College uh, and the first African-American student to attend Auburn University in January 1964. I had the honor to meet him several times, and he joked, he said, I didn't want to go to your Cal College. Uh, and uh, uh, noting that history of, of Auburn as a, a, a technical land-grant institution, but he said somebody had to do it. And what Dr. Franklin did at Auburn is what Hosea Williams and so many other thousands did in the movement. Somebody had to do it. Somebody had to take up the baton, take up the torch, pass the baton, light the way for those who come after. Growing up in Atlanta, I remember visiting what I think I remember from Georgia history is billed as one of the greatest granite outcroppings in the world, Stone Mountain, with its relief sculpture of leaders of the Confederate States of America, military and political alike. And so when I heard those eloquent words about cropping out, I thought about outcropping and how, in some ways, here is this what to me is a visual obscenity, that the, the history that we put on the side of a mountain is a history that is steeped in hatred and enslavement and the deprivation of basic human and civil rights. And so I hope in his own way, Dr. Rice tonight starts to give us a new sculpture, a new vision of what history might look like uh, where we can all imagine a mountainside that's populated with the faces of people who brought about freedom and who lifted people up instead of knocked them down, who ennobled people, women, men. Dr. Uh, Rice tells the story of Jose Williams as someone who pioneered night marches. Those marches were terrifying. Terrible things happened to night marchers. But Jose Williams lit not just a candle, he was an incandescent bonfire uh, in the night. And I, for one, am so, so grateful uh, that we now know his story better, and I honor his family, uh, and I honor Rolandus's family, who have been such an important part of his journey. He is not only an amazing scholar, but an outstanding human being, and it is a great privilege to know him and to be here tonight. Thank you so much. We would like to invite Mr. Ernie Suggs from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution to speak about the paper's coverage of Hosea Williams. Following Mr. Suggs, my mom, Dana Rice, will introduce my dad. Thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. Uh, my name is Ernie Suggs, as she mentioned. I work for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. and. Um, Dr. Rice wanted me to talk about the paper's role in covering uh, Mr. Uh, Brother Hosea Williams. And I came to the paper in 1997, and um, I came from Durham, North Carolina. I worked at um, a newspaper there. I attended a black, a black college, North Carolina Central University. And um, I was hired to work at the paper to cover race and to cover the civil rights movement. And I see my friend Sue Ross there. And as, I'm, you know, as you can see by my gray hair, I'm not as uh, young as I perhaps seem. But uh, moving here in 1997, I was able to get to know what I call this second generation of founding fathers of the United States of America, all these civil rights leaders who lived in Atlanta. Andy Young, Coretta Scott King was still alive, uh, Joseph Lowry, um, C.T. Vivian, and Hosea Williams. And Hosea Williams was Hosea Williams, to me, and, and, I, and I wrote in my obituary of him, and I write all these obituaries, unfortunately, or fortunately, I write all these obituaries of all these great civil rights leaders. And, and the obituary, no, actually the coverage of his funeral, I wrote that, um, the lead of the story, I wrote that his funeral attracted everyone from the White House to the poorhouse. 
And that's who he was when you talk about these civil rights leaders in Atlanta. He was on a different level because he was so much, and no one, everyone's a man, of, everyone is of the people, but he was so much a man of the people and so much grounded in the community. He was this local God, in my opinion, because you know he was always around, he was always there, he was always accessible. And um, I had to go to the office today, I work from home, but I had to go to the office today. And I looked up um, our coverage of him, and since 1986, which is when our electronic filing system started, uh, up until now, we've written over 3,000 stories about Hosea Williams in some form or the other. And I wrote 87 of those stories. So he was always someone who was very important. You know, I think, I, I forgot who said it, but he was always someone who was there, who was always important. Whatever he said meant something. It was always important that we covered him. Um, you know, it's important that we, we continue to write about his legacy. Just a few months ago, I was hanging out with the Omlamis, you know, writing about the 50th anniversary of Hosea, of Hosea Helps. Is that, that, yeah, Hosea, I want to make sure I get the right name, the, right, the, the new name, Hosea Helps, in terms of what he is continuing to do. And, and you know, the paper is continuing to cover that. We, 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 we see him, I see him, because I cover race and culture, I see him as this Mount Rushmore of Atlantans, Mount Rushmore of Americans, rather, who, who played a major role in shaping this country. And I, and I as a reporter, as a journalist, I, I value that tremendously. I remember, um, uh, I, I, I remember talking, I'm not gonna say who I was, who I was talking to, but I was talking to someone about Hosea Williams, and I cover, you know, again, I cover all, you know, I covered last year um, the passing of C.T. Vivian and John Lewis. And I covered all that stuff. And as a matter of fact, like last month, I won a big award for the coverage of John Lewis's uh, death, his life and death. And all the stories that I wrote and all the stories all across the country about John Lewis, who was a great person who I love dearly, mentioned about he led the march across the bridge. And he did. You know, he, that's, no, uh, that's, an, that's a fact. But I always tell people that Hosea Williams is right next to him. He was standing right next to him as they crossed that bridge. And I think uh, whatever the quote is, uh, he asked John Lewis if he can swim. That was, yeah. So I hope that's, I'm sure that's important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, so, you know, you mentioned um, how, you know, his legacy has somehow, you know, we, don't, we sometimes forget about Hosea Williams. And I just want the family to know and Rolandus to know that as a reporter, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, he's never gonna be forgotten. He's never, not as long as I'm working there. And they say, and I'll close, because I want to hear Dr. Rice speak just as eagerly as you guys do, that, um, and that's why I was looking at my phone while someone was talking. I wasn't on Facebook or anything. I was looking, <laughs> I was trying to make sure I get the quote right. But uh, journalism is a rough draft of history. And, you know, the 3,000 stories that we've written, the, the 100 stories that I've written about um, Hosea Williams, that was all in preparation for what Dr. Rice is doing. And the, the great scholarship not, you know, not, not to say that I, I'm the cause of his book, but the great scholarship that he has produced is what we need. And that's gonna be the foundation of Dr. I mean, of, of, of Brother Williams' life, just telling that full, rich story. Well, as a journalist, I'm able to kind of pull things together and, you know, I write about the good and the bad, and, you know, there are some things about all of us that, we've, that I've written about that is not always positive and that's not always, does not always shed a great light on someone. So I, I, all these stories and all these 3,000 stories, you know, about, you know, Hosea Feed the Hungry, about his TV show, about his funeral, about running for city council, all that stuff that I was able to gather in, the, in these 3,000 stories, Dr. Rice has been able to concisely put together and what we know is going to be a great, compelling book that hopefully will win the National Book Award. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm appreciative of, um, of his work. Um, I look forward to, you know, and again, I kind of like um, pattern myself at all these civil rights leaders. And C.T. Uh, Vivian has this great library. He had this great library in his house. And when I built my house, I built a, um, a library that I wanted to pattern after his. So um, I look forward to adding your book to my library. Hopefully I get a signed copy of it. And um, I will cherish it. And I, uh, I, I look forward to reading it. And I look forward to hearing your conversation. So thank you very much. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. Um, and he also, and this is not about me, you know, but he also inspired me because on March 8th, my book comes out on Andy Young. So hopefully you guys can, um, we're going to have an event at the Carter Center at some point, but thank you very much for that inspiration.
for me. Thank you. So this has been a long time coming. <laughs> I have had the pleasure of seeing this book from its inception to completion. I call it a divine experience because these past several years were met with many challenges. But Rolandus never wavered and was going to do whatever it took to breathe life back into this giant of a man so that written history would know and understand his importance to the civil rights movement and being a major catalyst in moving forward legislation that we now understand the importance of now more than ever. The life of a professor at any institution already comes with many challenges. Teaching at an HBCU requires one to teach four plus courses a semester, making it nearly impossible sometimes to publish. Couple this responsibility with being at the administrative level um, as dean of an undergraduate division, dean of a graduate school, assistant vice president for both academic and student affairs respectively, chief diversity officer, and now vice president of academic affairs at Russ College. Rolandus Plate was never empty through this process. As if all of these responsibilities were not enough for one man to handle, Rolandus and I have been very obedient to the word of God that we have done our part with being very fruitful and multiplying. <laughs> we have four, but trust me when I say, the four that we've been blessed with can easily make one feel as though they are an entire basketball team. My husband is a real life superhero. Our babies literally see him as Michael Jackson. They fall out in his presence and will literally fight for a moment of his time. The Lord somehow blessed Rolandus with the mental stamina to handle it all. I sometimes sit back in complete awe. I know, however, that everything comes together because it is all divinely orchestrated by God. I tell Ro all the time, if I ever thought of questioning whether or not God is real, I need not look any further than what he has done in his life. He truly has his hands on him. And this book is part of that divine plan. I am elated that the opportunity has now come for the world to turn the pages and likewise learn about the incomparable Hosea Williams. Let us now turn our attention to the screen to watch the book trailer. And if we could dim the light. very difficult to solve an argument between any two groups of citizens, black and white or otherwise, unless the leaders of the two groups are eager to see a solution to the problem. I personally do not think that Hosea Williams is seeking a solution. He's not trying to establish communications between the blacks and the whites. I think he is trying to get publicity for himself and to create dissension. And this makes it very difficult for those in the black community who have a legitimate 
grievance or for the white leaders who are seeking to avoid disturbances in their own community and to meet legitimate grievances to get together to work the problem out. And when those come in from the outside and agitate, it's wrong. It's wrong in the black community, it's wrong in the white community, particularly for a community like Columbus, Georgia, where the people are getting along to have somebody to come out and create and precipitate trouble. Are you putting the finger on Mr. Williams as the cause of the weekend trouble in Columbus? Very specific. Jose Williams, chief racist. Jose Williams, uh, he is a devoted citizen of Savannah and America, believing in the basic principles of democracy. We bring you today to Forsyth County, Georgia, just 30 miles north of Atlanta, which in the past few weeks has gained the reputation of being a hotbed of racism and the current battlefield of the civil rights movement. He and Jose Williams and others led them across that bridge and we've all seen the film, the footage and the photographs. Essentially, the temporary units, because this is what the coalition rejected. This is allowed to speak but, but the superintendent. The board promised we do not have to go to the superintendent. The board promised us an answer in all fairness. We are citizens of this community, and we want an answer. And this is why you're not giving an answer. We're not going to take no job. We want an answer to our children. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present to you the author of the hour, Dr. Rolandus Rice. As you all can tell, my wife is clearly the star, who is certainly a star with, within her own right. Before I continue, let me thank uh, everyone on the panel, my amazing children, my wonderful wife, my professors, Dr. Emerson, for this medal I will cherish. And whenever they lay me in the ground, Dana, this is going with me. All right. Uh, Mr. Suggs, thank you. Um, I can't talk about that video without recognizing the creative genius who put it together. Mr. Jared Reader, would you please stand? And one does not recognize the husband without the beautiful wife, Miss Nina Rita. Thank you. Um, um, the Temptations is my favorite movie. And there's this scene where David Ruff is saying, ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. Um, nobody's coming to see me. This is all about Hosea Williams. So um, we're going to go through the presentation and my, my daughters, they're going to earn their keep. So uh, I believe one will start off doing the clicking. And I believe I just turn this on. And OK. So Maddie, what you do, you just click. You click the bottom button, OK? okay. All right. So you can go over there if you want to. You can sit back down if you like. So I argue, everybody, this is a providential project. I see uh, my first pastor, Pastor James Edgerson, and his wife just walked in. Pastor Edgerson, thank you so much for, for coming. So again, a providential project. Next slide, Maddie. Um, it starts with my mother. All right? And, and there's a... There's an a, a image there of my mother not at Alabama State. She came to see me going down to Pensacola one day. And right next door to here is the Apex Museum. My mother took me there as a child. And every summer, we would go to the Samuel L. Jones Boys Club in East Lake. <laughs> and my mother, single mother, would, would drop us off at the Boys Club before she went to work. And she would point and say, that's where old crazy Hosea lives. All right. I was eight years old, Miss O. So the seed was planted by my mother. Um, but it didn't stop there. And as I talk about my own mother, I talk, think about my own children, Rolandus, Remington, Madison, and Marley, about planting the seeds 
Um, there's an image there of Alabama State. So Alabama State uh, houses the Interpretive Museum, the third one on the Selma to Montgomery Trail. Dr. Robinson is far more able to articulate uh, that, that, that project there. So I learned about the Selma to Montgomery March in great detail while a graduate student. Um, but you see a picture of my wife and I. We were in Hilton Head. And thankful to our amazing parents, William and Stanley, we never had to pay to go. But I always had a book, reading. So I was studying for my qualifying exams, Dr. Carter. I believe that's America in our time. Um, so it was always a consuming effort. I look in the back, I see Commander Deese, who had me doing push-ups uh, in the cafeteria at Lithonia High. Thank you, Commander Deese, for the discipline. Um, Next to that, you see the Ambassador Andrew Young. I met him when I was working at the King Center. 2014, I was writing speeches for Bernice King as a special assistant. And we see him, it was, a, I believe, a gathering recognizing Dr. King for his Nobel Laureate in 1964. I tell Ambassador Young about my work. I was writing the dissertation at the time. And he says, well, I really think you should turn that into a book. And I had not even defended, but again, someone planting a seed. And it started with the images here. So again, ain't nobody coming to see Rolandus. It's really about all of you all who poured into me so that I could produce this work. So as my, as my wife said, that no one will ever forget the contributions of the Reverend Dr. Hosea Williams. I knew I, I had gold the moment I walked into this library. Mr. Suggs writes, I believe the first article I read was um, the article that shows Jose Williams passing. I believe the, the, the fight is over, Mr. Suggs. And in that article, Miss O, she says, my father, you may not remember this, my father was a prophet without honor. And, and I believe that was the title of the dissertation coming from your quote. So the more I read, I realized this man did, was not recognized the way that he should have been recognized. So I come to the library and I knew with Madison, she was four years old then. I said, Madison, we have to document this because one day people will know about this man. Um, so by, by the, the, the papers that were here, um, I want to thank those who processed it. So I saw the personal writings. Um, personal correspondence, uh, video and photographic footage. So I was able to hear his voice and capture that as much as I could into the narrative. So the goal for me was to count. So I did not want anybody to hear or understand Rolandus's voice, but to really see and feel Hosea Williams. This quote, everybody, it set the stage for everything. And I won't read it all. You all could read it for yourselves. Um, but this is Dorothy Cotton. And I was listening to this oral history that is deposited in the Tulane Library. So she's, t she's being interviewed, I believe, sometime in the 1980s. And she said, in this way, Martin said to me, who is going to get out there on the streets and organize the way Hosea does? Because everybody said, oh, Hosea, he, he wanted to control everything. He wanted to have the biggest budget. He wanted to have the biggest staff. But there is a reason for that. And it took me to dive into this man's life to truly understand why his attitude and his uh, driven, hard scrabble nature forced him to really be consumed by the movement. And I figured it out. I think, next slide, Maddie. Um, I came across, across the term an organic intellectual. Now, he wasn't the conventional intellectual because, again, those are the professors. We, we sit in the ivory tower and we write, we publish, and we teach. Um, an organic intellectual, everybody, is someone who learns about the world, who seeks to change it by being a part of it. So when Dorothy Cotton said, well, Jose was always uh, difficult 
to work with. This term explains it all. He was so firmly committed to social action that it was inextricably woven into the fabric of his existence. Uh, social action was all-consuming. It was indivisible from his personhood. This is why, but Martin Luther King understood it. When other folks said, oh, Jose is to this, he is to that, um, King said no, and I believe Dr. Emerson always tells this quote that he was able to tame the wild horses. Because in that group, you had some brilliant brothers, all college educated. Of course, there was King in the middle. There was Abernathy, a graduate of Alabama State College, I believe a degree in mathematics, class 1950, Dr. Autry. Um, you had Jose Williams, of course, a degree in chemistry from Morris Brown. You had Andrew Young, a degree, I want to say, in either poli sci from Howard University. Um, you had Jesse Jackson, I believe, North Carolina A&T. So you had a group of people who were brilliant in their own right, and they all had egos. And it took King to, to again, tame the wild horses. Next slide, Maddie. So does anybody know any football player who still plays football at age 70? <laughs> Me either. And Tom Brady is the GOAT, but he's in his 40s, I think. Jose Williams was 72 years old when he led one of his last documented protests. Now, if I'm looking at, uh, if I'm a baseball writer, Mr. Suggs, and I want to see who's going to be enshrined in the Hall of Fame, I'm going to look at their body of work. So I look at Jose's body of work if he is to be considered as a founding father of a newer, better America at least 130 arrests. Uh, a part of, uh, played a role in, in agitating for three significant pieces of legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Um, his organization that he founded, that is still carried on by Mrs. O and Mr. O has fed at giving away at least a million plus meals. All right, um, at age 61, he led a march of at least 20,000 individuals in Forsyth County at 61. Most folks at 61 may not be able to walk from here to the end of the building, but at 61, he invented the night march and it terrified people. And my colleague, I wanna call him Howie, but he's still Dr. Robinson to me, um, he wrote a magnificent unpublished narrative on uh, the civil rights story in Savannah. So I learned about the night marches. And it takes Willie Bolden, who's no longer here, to talk about the night marches. How Jose would go down to the park and there's this Indian chief, Tomatichi, and he would just go crazy. Um, but again, Jose Williams, but this is the interesting part, everybody. Jose Williams was the embodiment of middle class material wealth. He was working for the federal government, again, a degree in chemistry. And he had uh, a nice home. He had the nice lawn. He had a white secretary. In his mind, Hosea thought that he made it. And then he had the moment that Buddha had, Dr. Carter. He had an epiphany. He realized that yeah, I'm living a life of material wealth, but everybody else isn't. So when Joseph Lowry and John Lewis said that Hosea gave up more than anybody, that was not an understatement. He gave up more than anyone else in that circle because all of them had wives, they all had children. But he was independently comfortable because all of them were getting their income from the churches. But Hosea, again, a degree in chemistry, he, if he protested, he could pay for it with his job. And, and I know I love my wife and my children, and as much as I want equality for everybody, I don't know if I would have the intestinal fortitude to sacrifice to put my wife and children at risk the way Hosea Williams did, even to age 72. Next slide, Maddie. 
You're on it, baby girl. <laughs> All right, so one more slide. So um, I wrote the book into ch 10 chapters. And you heard a little bit about uh, Reverend Williams' life. Born to blind parents, not just a blind mother or a blind father, but two blind parents. What are the odds that someone could come out of that environment in deep southwest Georgia? But he had the influence of his grandparents. Now, as I look at my grandmother today, I know the influence of a grandmother. Um, Turner Williams. And I had pictures here, but I took out because I uh, wanted to move, move things along. But Hosea was, they called him Little Turner. And his father, his grandfather rather, owned land. He couldn't read and write. Well, I know he couldn't read, Ms. Over. Tell me if I'm wrong. But uh, everyone said, well, nobody could cheat him. All right. Um, so again, it starts with that. The second chapter, the defiant head house nigger is what Hosea called himself. Um, he felt like he was the head house nigger because he was getting the benefits of wealth while everyone else suffered. Um, but I wanted to really talk about, believe it or not, chapter 7. Jose Williams, they protested at the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> not just the Kentucky Derby. Um, in 1969, they were protesting the moon launch. There was a sign that says, and you will see it later on, that you could, the amount of money that you are spending in the program to put a man on the moon, you could feed every hungry child in America. Jose Williams wasn't scared to speak an uncomfortable truth. Uh, so again, you will find out this giant of a man within 10 chapters. And again, a very complicated and complex man. Um, no one can describe Jose Williams in one word. Webster can't do it. I certainly can't do it because, again, he was such a complicated and a complex figure. Next slide, Maddie. Um, I could not be in Atlanta and not discuss this slide. Now, I know full well that I'm standing in Congressman Lewis's old district. Um, call the march off. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. tells Hosea Williams on Sunday, March 7th. There's not many people who would defy Martin Luther King Jr. Think about that. I know if I defy my boss, and I'm looking at a board member, Dr. Betty Baptist Jones, who serves on the Board of Trustees at Russ College, please raise your hand. A brilliant MD and PhD. But if I defy my boss, the president, there's a chance that me and Dana and the kids will be leaving Holly Springs the same day. But he defied Martin Luther King anyway. And um, I, want, I wanted to include this, this quote by uh, Dr. W.F. Brundage, Dr. Carter. And it talks about historical memory. And I'll just go down to the very last sentence. Historical memory, Brundage says, is the product of intentional creation. I've never seen an, uh, a, a, a cartoonist figure or a, a heavenly depiction of Jose Williams crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When Congressman Lewis died, the, the references were always made to the Edmund Pettus Bridge and these very beautiful, amazing, captivating pictures. But again, it was a product of intentional creation. Um, what if? Jose Williams had listened. What if he said, oh, okay, Dr. King, I understand. Uh, we're not ready because in, in reality, they weren't. On Sunday, March 7th, uh, they did not have the, the supplies to make it the 54 miles from Selma to Montgomery. And King knew it, Jose knew it, but he was insistent on doing it anyway. And I'm gonna tell you how important this is that came from a president, a sitting president, uh, in the next slide. This last quote, if I was to turn down the lights right now, it would be dark for a minute, but then your eyes would adjust. You'll still be able to see because your eyes have, and I don't understand the medical terms of this. I see you, Dr. Hollingshed. Thank you for coming. Um, then you won't be able to tell where you're going until your eyes adjust. History is the same way. 
our eyes have adjusted. And I'm not saying anything about Congressman Lewis is darkness, but our eyes have been trained to see that John Lewis was the one responsible for Bloody Sunday, and it was really Jose Williams. I'll tell you how I know that. Now, there's been different stories of how this was told, Mizzo. Some said they pulled straws. Others said that they did a coin flip. And that narrative has changed over time. But at the end of the day, um, Jose Williams was there. He had been, uh, he got the, the marchers ready the day before, the morning of. And again, this was the narrative that has been told. And again, no, no knock against Congressman Lewis because his accomplishments and contributions to American history speak for itself. But on that day, on that day, um, we must recognize that that would not have happened if there was not someone who told Dr. King no. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson understood it. This is what Lyndon Johnson said the following week. At times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. So what Lyndon Johnson is saying is that what happened in Selma, Alabama was just as important as the battles of the Revolutionary War or the end of the Civil War, which when America was reborn in 1865. So again, this is not Rolandus Rice saying how important Bloody Sunday was. This is Lyndon Johnson, the 36th president of the United States of America, a white man from the South in the 1960s who was very close friends with Senator Richard B. Russell, who was a building name for him around the corner, but he did it anyway. Next slide, Marlon Marr. Everyone has seen this image. And, and, and again, everybody, I'm a history professor. And I missed the classroom, if you can't tell. Um, but this was taken April 3rd, 1968. And you see Hosea, Reverend Williams, Jesse Jackson, Dr. King, and Ralph Abernathy. And I'll tell you why I showed this picture in a moment. Next slide, Marley Marr, and you're doing a great job. One of my exam questions for Dr. Carter was discuss 1968. And 1968 could be a class, a semester length class. But one author said that it was a sp spontaneous combustion of rebellious spirits. So there was the Tet Offensive, riots, King is assassinated. LBJ doesn't seek re-election. Bobby Kennedy is shot and killed in June of 1968. But a faithful lieutenant to the end. This is Hosea here. They're pulling Dr. King's body onto an American Airlines plane to bring the body back here to Atlanta. And again, being on Auburn Avenue, the, at one point the richest Negro street in the world, um, we had to talk about this particular image. But the next slide. Makes it all make sense. Go, Marlon Marr. Not many people have seen this image. This was a few moments after Dr. King is laid to rest at Southview Cemetery. And if where do we go from here was a picture. You see Jesse Jackson looking a bit lost. Um, Abernathy, Ambassador Young. Hosea Williams, where, where do we go from here? If Hosea Williams left the movement that day, he would have still been a first ballot founding father. Because by 1968, he had already helped to lead the efforts to desegregate public spaces in Savannah, the first city in the South to do it before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He had already led the marches across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965. He was already a crucial figure in the Civil Rights Act of 64, particularly with the St. Augustine campaign. Um, so there's truly 
two different Jose Williamses. He, again, if he had resigned at age 42, we would be writing, a, I, this book would have been written about Hosea 30 years ago, long before I was born. Um, but again, this is his body of work by 1968. And this image is in the book. I believe I got this from the Stanford archives and they let me use it for free, thank goodness. Um, but again, um, where were they supposed to go from there? All right, next slide, Marley. So there are certain themes that I discuss in the book. Next slide, Mar. Um, the AJC said Hosea was Atlanta's best known motorist. <laughs> All right. Um, for me to tell the story authentically, I had to discuss the driving record. And if truth be told, uh, thanks to my mother and father-in-law, if they want to tell the story about me, I have a driving record too. But that's the reality. All right. Um, you see some of the, the details there. And Hosea said, you know, this is evidence that they are, are not only trying to silence me, but to destroy the remaining black leadership. And there was evidence because um, there was a judge named Richard Bell. You all remember Richard Bell. He made a name for himself by taking the hard line against Hosea Williams. He was the least qualified judge to run for the Georgia Supreme Court, I believe, in 1982 or 83. He wins the seat to the Georgia Supreme Court based on the notoriety that he received for taking the hard line against Hosea Williams. And there were times in which Hosea was pulled over for driving drunk, but there were also times that he was acquitted in the courtroom because the records, I believe the DUI test that they had, they, uh, they would take him down to Grady and they would conduct the test and they said, well, you know, after the, the jury looked at the material, the man wasn't drunk. Um, but again, attempts by uh, the political elite to disparage a man who had given so much to the black struggle. Next slide, Marley. Ms. Randolph may be aware of this picture. She probably helped to, uh, to write the press release. Um, so Jose's license was suspended. And I don't know if, if he really liked to ride Mart at the time. And I believe Joseph Lyre was on the board at Mart at one point. So there were some dynamics that I discussed in the book also. Um, but they took his license. So Hosea goes and buys a 10-speed bike, <laughs> makes a speech from the steps of the Capitol, and he says, I will not be silenced. If I have to ride a bike or even skate for the rights of black and poor people, I'll continue fighting for my people until we are free or un until I'm dead. Right. That was in 75. He fought for his people until he was dead. A prophet without honor. And the last quote was, was so searing. Um, I may not have a driver's license, but I still have my dignity and self-respect. And I had to, Dana said, well, why are you going to put the picture in there again? I said, Dana, I like the suit. <laughs> so again, this is uh, Reverend Williams riding a bike to work to help support and fight for poor black and brown people. Next slide. Um, now, this really does help to explain who Zell Williams was. And again, I relied a lot on the AJC from the late 80s through the early 90s. Um, and the, the quote here says, he is in short the tradition of American populism, which has always included figures who combine brains, rascality, voter appeal, and the guts and availability to speak an uncomfortable truth. That was in 1991. And I said, man, let me try to put that in context as I write about this man. Next slide, Marley. So Jose is in jail. And the AJC endorsed him while he was in jail. <laughs> and, and you see the endorsement, it says, uh, the, the, the paper's endorsement of Reverend Williams is based on his effectiveness as a legislator, which is okay, uh, and not his effectiveness as a driver, which is not. <laughs> but listen to that, everybody. I can't win an election if I don't go out and campaign. 
Jose didn't have the luxury to campaign. He was in jail. But next slide, Marley. Georgia jail civil rights vet wins re-election. <laughs> that tells me a variety of things. It tells me that people respected the contributions that this man made for them. Um, if, if, if Barack Obama goes to jail, I don't know if he would have won in 2008. I don't know if Joe Biden could have beat Donald Trump if he was in jail. I don't know. But I do know that in this year, 1982, the year I was born, again, another sign that I was supposed to do this. Man wins re-election from a jail cell. I guess my baby girl is tapping out. <laughs> um, these are some of the words that people use to describe Reverend Williams, bombastic. And I won't say all of them. A sinister organizing genius. Barrel chested. <laughs> Bull in a china shop, larger than life. Erratic, fearless, reckless. A tireless self promoter. A useless mischief maker. We need some mischief makers, I would argue. Next slide. Now, Jose had keen political instincts, could teach a class, I believe, on political science if he wanted to. There's a picture there of him and Mrs. King, and, and there is um, not a dearth of literature that shares or talks about how they were, they had some disagreements from time to time. Um, but Williams always clashed with those who he believed were a part of the establishment or the downtown power structure. Um, and I talk about in the book how he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Coretta Scott King. Most folk would not tell Miss King no. And I'm saying this on Auburn Avenue, right down the street from the King Center. Uh, I worked for her daughter, and I couldn't tell Bernice no. But he did not have a problem defying anybody who he was philosophically at odds with. Um, and if you drive around Atlanta, some of these names you see on some of the streets. So that shows you the power that these people had. Um, Maynard Jackson, Jesse Hill Jr., Herman Russell, Joseph Lowry, and those battles were epic as they played out very publicly uh, with the SCLC. Ambassador Young and a governor and soon to be president of the United States. Jose Williams did not care. Sometimes we need folks who don't care. Um, now, now, Williams was also very skillful and collaborated when it suited his interests. Um, I believe chapter 10, the title of it is I'm an Opportunist, and he says that. Now, Hosea liked to win, but he wanted other people to win too, all right? So uh, again, you, if, once you get the book, you'll see these dynamics, and it plays out very publicly in the pages. So next slide. Um, he has some business ventures. Um, uh, Jose Williams, I, I saw this article and I said, wow, Miss Terry, I know you probably remember this article pretty well. Miss Terry Randolph was a very close assistant to Jose Williams and was essential uh, to his effectiveness for many, many events. I think Miss Randolph is due also a round of applause. Um, so when they asked Julian Bond about Hosea's ventures, Julian says, oh, I'm sure he's doing great Christian work. Um, another guy said, oh, well, it's the street ministry for the poor and the press. So everybody's not coming to church every Sunday and paying tithes. Again, Hosea catered to those who were forlorn and forgotten. Um, now, he, he, he did have a very successful bingo operation. I, I like to play a little bingo. I don't know about y'all. But uh, the paper argues that he grossed more than $4 million from 78 to 91. But the paper also clarified there's no indication that any of the money went to Williams. And, and I'm going to take the paper at his word. No indication that no money went to Jose Williams. Um, next slide. So the case for Jose Williams as a first ballot founding father, and we're at the end. Next slide. Now, John Meacham writes about King as a founding father. 
I don't think anyone in this room would argue that Martin Luther King Jr. should not be recognized as a founding father. But Meacham says that King was the architect of the 21st century. Now, that's, that's pretty profound when King died before the 21st century began. Now, John Meacham, you all know a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, but next slide. John Lewis says it. Jose Williams must be looked upon as one of the founding fathers of the new America. Through his actions, he helped liberate all of us. Now, this is the one who people uh, tout as the, the orchestrator of, I think, one of the most fateful marches in American history. But John Lewis even had to recognize Jose Williams' contribution. So when I hear Dr. Emerson talk about how images were cropped out, you only see John Lewis, and, and it was disturbing to me, and I didn't understand it. Um, but there's a term that I'll call palatability politics, that which is palatable and what people can accept. That's what they tend to embrace. Um, next slide. We're almost done, everybody. Bill Clinton. Uh, Jose Williams should be recognized as an American foot soldier and driving force behind the Voting Rights Act. Jose Williams was a profile in courage. He dedicated his entire life to making sure we never take a detour on the road to freedom. So I don't care what Rolandes Rice does. Maybe no president will talk about what I've been able to do. And that's fine. Three US presidents have said in official capacities the role of this man. Lyndon Johnson in 65. Um, President Clinton in 2000, and Barack Obama just down the street at John Lewis's service. So in my mind, three presidents have already made the case for a Presidential Medal of Freedom. They've already made the case for his face to be emblazoned on the Mount Rushmore of a new America. I didn't have to do that. I'm just saying what you all have already said. Now it's time to us to come together and make that happen. Next slide. The last, very last slide. <laughs> this is the question of the hour, everybody. How would Jose Williams be portrayed if he had a chauffeur? What if we take away all the articles about the police arrests and the stops and the alcohol? And all, where would the world see of Jose Williams? Now, if I'm a betting man, I would argue that Martin Luther King, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, I can go down the list of founding fathers. They all had some things that were not necessarily uh, things they would talk about with their moms. But the evidence has spoken for itself. And I, I wrote this with the full anticipation of having to um, defy the criticism. Well, Rice, why did you get that? Why did you say that? Why, why did you do that? Everything has a citation. And so for me, as we talk about this newer, better America, you cannot talk about that without recognizing the contributions of the Reverend Hosea Williams. So in that vein, I will say long live the Reverend Hosea Williams. Um,